listening to the Beaver County History Podcast, a production of the Social Voice Project. What is history? Located on Route 68, west of the town of Midland. Local history seems to be a straightforward idea. One of the most significant archaeological sites in western Pennsylvania, west of Vanport Township. What is history? The Ingram Richardson Manufacturing Company of Beaver Falls. It's the history of a small, well-defined area. And construction began on the shipping port atomic power station. What is history? Edward Dempster Merrick had a dream and a vision in the late 1800s to create a cultural and artistic center for New Brighton. History is his story. And it's also her story. The New York Metropolitan Museum of Art was so impressed with our frames that they actually have a collection. The IBM 604 is a very rare artifact of early industrial computing. There are only three known to exist worldwide, and only one unit is still operational. This computer is so rare that not even the IBM Corporation owns one. And in a lot of your big museums, the viewers are roped off, so you can't even get, you know, as close. Whereas here, you can walk literally right up nose to nose with the painting. We actually have a chalkboard in there that anybody that graduated from Rochester, we ask them to sign the board with the year that they graduated. And it's kind of fun because people will come in and see somebody on the board that they graduated with. What is history? The Legionville site, located along current day Route 65 and Dust Avenue, between Baden, Pennsylvania and Average, Pennsylvania, was one of the first formal basic training sites for the military of the United States. What is history? It's the history of a small, well-defined area. At the place called Wallace City, situated at the crossroads of what is now Route 989 and Freedom Crider Road, an oil boom started in 1900. Yeah, that's a kind of an interesting side story. There was a family living just outside of Darlington, and they had a tavern, and they were Southern sympathizers. And Southern sympathizers were quite often called copperheads. The upper part of Bridgewater, which was known as Sharon, was the scene of a part of Aaron Burr's operations in carrying out his great conspiracy for the establishment of an empire in the Southwest. Sadly, nothing remains of the boat yards used to build the boats that may have been used in one of the biggest political conspiracies in United States history. Thank you for having me on the podcast. This is one that I definitely enjoy that dives into local history. What is history? It is an account of past events and sequence of time. The people, the places, and the events in all of our lives. They know the people that grew up in Beaver Falls, the people that grew up in Southside. They know their history. You know, we need the smaller organizations to keep that history alive and going, and we need the community members to continue to support that. Or else, years from now, it's not going to exist. You're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast. It was very interesting and really brought history to life. There's an enormous need for volunteers because there's generally not sufficient resources for paid staff, you exactly. know, like a larger exactly. institution. So to keep these organizations running, the, the, just materially, physically, and in terms of programming as well, there needs to be volunteers. All organizations seem to be struggling with volunteerism. Well, I can think of many of the sites that don't open in the wintertime because they don't have heat. Right. I can think of a couple other sites that they're scraping pennies to pay the electric bill and the telephone bill. Right. You know, that makes it really hard to run an efficient organization, especially when you're collecting things. A textile box can cost 36 bucks per one box. Mm -hmm. How can you properly store the things that you're bringing in, the artifacts you're bringing in when you can't pay your electric bill? Right. And my personal opinion is we need all of these sites. I can't be the keeper of everything in Beaver County. The Vickery Mansion is not big enough. Right. They know the people that grew up in Beaver Falls, the people that grow up in Southside. They know their history. I grew up in Ohioville. I don't know the history of, of Ambridge from one side of the county to the other. So, you know, we need the smaller organizations to keep that history alive and going. And we need the community members to continue to support that or else years from now, it's not going to exist. We have done so much and people don't realize. Why is it going? Because people do not honor what our ancestors did. And the food goes along with all of that. You know, I think it's more important now than ever 
for us to be very prideful about where we've come from and continue to uh, struggle because we're not out of the struggle. And I say, but we always been here. You know, we're always here. You're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast, a production of the Social Voice Project. Hello. Today we will be showing you the correct way to clean chitlins. You know what? If no one's going to talk about soul food or the African-American experience here, which you can't separate the two, I'm going to do it. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. When I was younger, there were so many places you couldn't go, so you had your own. Mm -hmm. You had your own social life. You had your own activities. They weren't open. So they're more segregated. Yes, uh, yes, yes. So part of maybe the history of us, we haven't yet become a part of even some of the activities going on now, like the ethnic food celebration in May. I must make sure that you understand, I'm not a soul food cooker. (laughs) (laughs) And was not brought up on soul food. But uh, we do have people that cook very good. And churches have had soul food dinners. Yes. Uh, so I believe some of these churches, you still go and you get good soul food. Oh, well, yeah. I've yeah, been to get, a few. Yeah, yeah. It's, Midland. <laughs> yeah, Beaver Falls. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> New Brighton used to be. <laughs> right. When I moved to Alquipa when I was young, that's when I, I found out about soul food. Mm-hmm. I didn't find soul food in Rochester. <laughs> right. That my neighbor cooked soul food, and we'd, uh, we'd have each other sample food. Hoe cake, which was corn cornbread in a skillet. Mm, I had like never... cornbread. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had never seen that. I said, what is that? She said, this hoe cake. One day, I said to her, oh, I got a good soul food food today. Come over. And it was sauerkraut. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, what is that? I said, sauerkraut. She said, that is not soul food. <laughs> so all of the African-American persons in my day did not eat soul food. That, that was uh, something when they all, when people came to work in the mills or something, and they brought, like your, uh, the different populations, they brought their food too. Sweet potato pie, mm. uh, that wasn't known here, but in Aliquippa it was. And people still now, they have like contests. Who makes the best sweet potato pie? I mean. I think when the meals started opening, there was a recruitment or a people from down south, as you mentioned. And that's where most of the slaves were from the uh, Middle Passage when they came up here and like you said, migrated out. They brought the food with them. And so Mm -hmm. some of us, uh, like yourself, didn't grow up that way, but certainly we've learned about the fried chicken and the chitterlings and the uh, corn, we call it cornbread now, not (laughs) what you call it, but it's the same thing. Yes, I see soul food. It's more uh, seasoned with fat in it. Soul food, as I see it, is rich. Well, what it is or what, The history says it's been, it's what the white plantation owners did not want. And so, therefore, the Africans, Americans, Africans, they seasoned it up so it would taste better. It was what, it was scraps. Like chillings. The intestines of a pig, like who wants to eat that? I do. Call the sister, we're going to meet at Monticello's. I said, no, they're going to kill me. So this is a story of my arrest and brief incarceration, which I generally don't talk about. You know, people say, you know, oh, this is the affirmation of life. The after, It looks like somebody was murdered. Okay, now, for real, we're going to start our second storytelling event at Beaver Falls Coffee and Tea Company, featuring our local color, Jim Adams. Craig Bennett on guitar, Scott Colburn, and Kevin Farkas. We all have a story. I thought if I told you my story, you'd tell me yours. You are listening to the Social Voice Project Podcast Network. Where are the stories? Where are the lessons? 
telling a story well is an important skill. Engage your audience. Build the scene. Build tension and release tension. Focus on what's important. Keep the flow logical. All right, go ahead. Try to tell a story. Okay, I believe that in order to learn how to tell stories, the best place to start is how to tell your own story. So your story of who you are and why you're here. Tell me a story. Well, I don't have any stories that would be appropriate for you today. Then tell me something inappropriate. Uh, it's like your cadence and your timing and you're looking at each other. Uh, you see a lot of uh, performing groups, they stand out in a long line and they're listening to the monitors and so they, they are just as good but that we have a different style in that we have to look at each other because uh, we can cue each other by dirty looks that Judy gives me. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, the, or, we just sang that verse. Uh. <laughs> You're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast. Dave, now, are you a trained musician? No, I don't have any um, proper training. I do everything by ear. My grandmother was a fiddler. She plays piano and she played a harmonica. And she used to tell stories about uh, when they were young teenagers and before uh, they would have singings uh, and this is around this area the little beaver area and, and they would go uh, every week they'd go to somebody's house and she she played uh, fiddle with a man named Sam Duncan who ended up being her neighbor when she got married and they played all their lives they uh, they got together and played and played the piano and and, and uh, everything people guitar people would bring stuff in and all my mother's uh, siblings would sing uh, harmony. They would just get together Christmas and uh, all the holidays. When any time they got together, they were they were singing. And uh, and, and we're we're still family, right? Yep. Right. Father and daughter. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's that's a part of this, right? That's it's a, it's right. a family thing. It is. We have going on here. They appreciate songs that are familiar to them. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than a a new song that they never heard before. You'll see their eye. They'll they'll bring back memories from. From uh, you know their childhood or or, or their their upbringing, upbringing and their dad or that we've had people come say that song I haven't heard it. my dad used to play that when I was a little girl you know or something and I haven't heard it since you know uh, and that's just I think it is our niche the old railroad songs and the old traditional uh, bluegrass songs and the gospel we do a lot of gospel the music that we play in our lives is valuable and we should pay attention and. Um, perhaps even pass it on and teach the next generation. Are you guys uh, teaching any bluegrass to any up-and-coming people that you know? Well, I'm not. Uh, we mentioned Haps. Uh, he's got a musical program down there at his yes. church. Down, it's called... Hum Church Music. Hum Church Music. And that uh, stands for... Homewood United Methodist Church Music. Yes. Yeah. And it, there are some kiddos there. They, they have probably a handful to 10 kids... Uh, every other week, and uh, they give free lessons, but they have, you know, HAP has people helping them teaching the different instruments. There's interest there. They're they're excited. There's a there's a family that's just starting to play together a little bit. Um, Mom plays the violin, and the boy plays mandolin. And he does a really good job. Okay, so you're taking these, I mean, you know, this is, you mentioned you do Jimmy Rogers from the right, 20s, and, right. uh, you know, probably the standards the songbook from the 40s and so forth. But here, you're taking stuff from the 70s, 80s and putting your own bluegrass spin on it, uh, vibe to it. Well, that's fascinating. So there's room in bluegrass to evolve, to adapt, to accommodate different things, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say so. How, how fascinating. Dave, are you going to put a distortion pedal on your guitar at some time and uh, <laughs> just test no, it just out? No, just shoot me. If, if you see me do that, just shoot me. <laughs> I'm not doing that, though. Gibson, I'm in I would love to hear that. That would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Judy Foster, Dave Foster, your band is East of Enon. Thank you so much for being on the Beaver County History Podcast and sharing your experiences here with bluegrass. I find this really fascinating, and I'm sure our listeners will too. And, and I think this is really important just to get this out here and have this conversation about this topic. It's really wonderful. So thanks for being on the show. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Among the many activities we engage in as humans, the making of art is the most sophisticated. You're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast, a production of the Social Voice Project. Around the world and through time, this question comes universally. 
What is art? We are here on location again at Merrick Art Gallery, one of Beaver County's hidden gems. This place is amazing. We're sitting in the grand gallery here with Sue Ireton, who's administrative assistant here, but she's also very, very knowledgeable about the artwork that's here. So welcome, Sue, for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. We are very excited to talk about art. And uh, gosh, there are so many paintings here, and they are just so wonderful. We could spend a week here. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, and in fact, I would like to spend my entire work time up here just staring at them. <laughs> For those who have not been here, and you have to come here to New Brighton, to the Merrick Art Gallery, when you come into this, the main gallery here and all the other rooms that they have, the artwork is displayed in the old salon style, which is vertically up the walls. So if you have poor eyesight, you may not be able to see the, the paintings way up there, which is, by the way, is one, where the Corbet is. There's actual Gustave Corbet here, which is amazing. It's way up there at the top. But some of these are just so huge. Wow, you know, what, five feet across some of these? I mean, just amazing works that are Uh, Well, you know what? I don't know this. I'm going to let you. You're the expert, Sue. That's why you're here. I'm doing your job for you. Tell us about the the art here. Okay. We have a very fine collection of 19th and 18th century American and European art. And in a lot of your big museums, the viewers are roped off two to three feet away from the wall. So you can't even get, you know, as close. Whereas here, you can walk literally right up nose to nose with the painting. Well, this is one of the few significant galleries where you can get so up close and personal yep. to these. I mean, you could get right up there and look at the cracking and the brush strokes. And to me, I find that it really fascinating. You know, yep. you cannot look at works of art like this online on your flat screen or your handheld devices or whatever and get it. You have to come here and you have to stand in front of a five foot painting. And let your eyeballs go from left to right and get up close. And that's how you get it, yes. I think. Right? Yeah. 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 Kevin, one more word about the frames. The New York Metropolitan Museum of Art was so impressed with our frames that they actually have a collection in New York at the gallery that they hang throughout the year at certain times. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He he bought more frames than he had paintings. Merrick, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Mer- Dempster, Dempster, Dempster. Merrick. Dempster. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Yeah. How interesting. Mm-hmm. Dempster lived in New York City after he worked here as an industrialist under the tutelage of his father. He went to New York and pursued his real love, which was art. So he was very well known in the New York City society circles, and um, he wanted the people of New Brighton and Beaver County to experience fine art. So he set up a trust, and that's how we've been able to keep the gallery free. There is no charge to come into the gallery. That's a remarkable thing yes. today. That's it a is. remarkable thing. And to think that he had that notion from the get-go. Yes. Right, and that, that I believe that is in the will, the, will, the mm-hmm. trust d- d- deed. Or- yes. So yeah, a lot of people say, oh, look at this gallery and uh, this art, it must be expensive, yada, yada, and the wealth, but to keep this place open free, I mean, that takes a lot of doing. Yeah. And so, you know, Alinka, as the new executive director, Sue, as one of the administrators here, I mean, you are doing an amazing job keeping this place mm-hmm. free. I mean, so as we've been sitting here podcasting today, we've had people come in walked around, they looked at art, they were talking. You could hear them on uh, earlier podcast episodes. That's the way this should be. This should be an active space Mm -hmm. where people come, they stand, they let their eyeballs walk around the art, but they also talk about the art. They talk to you. You Mm -hmm. guys are accessible to Mm -hmm. give the history of the building, of, of the art here. How amazing this is. With me today to talk about people and their stories of Beaver County is Chris Paget. So... There was once a young fellow who was mad for stories. Everywhere there was storytelling going on, he was to be found. People have always told stories, and examples of storytelling can be found in every country and every culture. Today's big question is, why are stories important? You're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast, a production of The Social Voice Project. Kevin Farkas, 
I'm with the Social Voice Project. We produce this podcast to explore and celebrate the rich heritage and significant, significant local history throughout Beaver County. And you know, a part of that history is people, right? Mm -hmm. People, history's just not stuff, you know, behind glass, old faded photographs. History is also about people and their experiences, their lives. So with me today to talk about people and their stories of Beaver County is Chris Padgett, who is a wonderful filmmaker and someone very interested in what I would call oral histories. Some people don't like that academic term. Hmm. Some people like to say just, you know, human stories, people's experiences, memories. What, what, what do you call the stories that you gather throughout history? And we'll talk about your project in particular, Chris. Hmm. Uh, but what do you call these stories that you gather? Well, I've been trying to figure out a way to categorize them. For a while, I was calling them um, sort of like video portraits, but... I think you're right. They're kind of like their life experiences of people. I, I would probably, yeah, tend to say they're human experiences, I guess, human human lives and stories and things like that, because they're connected to things that people have learned throughout living, by living their lives, I guess. So, Well, who cares? <laughs> Are you asking me who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm asking you who cares, because I get that all the time. Who cares? No, I mean, well, it's a serious question. Okay. Um, hey, your neighbor down the street was in the Korean War. Uh, what's his story? Why Why would you be interested, for example, in mm-hmm. uh, talking to that person and finding out what their experiences are? Well, I mean, there's so many reasons. Um, in, in the example that you mentioned, or any example, I was just thinking about it like uh, the past couple of days, and, and there's something about... I think seeking beauty and finding beauty and you can find it in a lot of people's stories because um, through what they've endured and through what they've um, had to overcome and anything like that, um, there's sometimes a hard pressed beauty and wisdom that people have found just by trying to come up against their life and and sometimes up against themselves, um, sometimes uh, whatever the struggle might be. It's a common, I think it's a common experience that people have where they've learned something or, or they've experienced something. And I think the sharing of their stories does something for them and it does something for, for us who listen, um, because we can, I think, have a give and take that, uh, that both or all people who are involved in that process can, can learn from and, and uh, become more full people, I guess. There's definitely um, a dialectic here. I mean, mm-hmm. that it is a give and take, as you put it. It's a back and forth conversation. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, some of this work is just someone talking on a camera and you don't, there's the omniscient narrator, the, right. the absent communicator, interlocutor, as we say in linguistics. But these conversations are very significant for, for both sides of, in our case, like the microphone or the camera lens. Mm hmm. In my background of doing veterans oral history, you know, we've had World War II veterans, uh, 70 years removed, who are going through the catalog of events, and they start thinking about their buddies, Mm -hmm. and they start thinking about horrific experience, sad experience, whatever, and just break down and start crying. Right. And afterwards, and this is my point of this, uh, we would be told, uh, you know what, I haven't thought of that in years. That was good for me. Hmm. Uh, cathartic. Now, you're not from this area, right? I am not. No, I'm from Illinois. You're yep. from Illinois. Mm-hmm. And yet, here you are. Uh, <laughs> you have this wonderful film company called Human City Films and this project yes. in particular called Rivertown Anthology. Yes. Voices of Beaver County. Yes. Yes. There you go. Mm-hmm. So, how's a guy from uh, Illinois, Illinois, as we say right here, <laughs> uh, get mixed up with all this uh, Rivertown stuff? Uh, well... Let's see if I can figure out how to how to talk about this well. Um, when I moved here, uh, it was to stay close to my daughter, who, whose other side of her family lives in Ambridge, and uh, her name's Annette. She's great. Anyway. Uh, shout out. <laughs> shout out to Annette. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, when I first moved here, I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do, and I started working at a community garden in Aliquippa. And um, when I was sitting there and working on simple things, 
and people would come by and they would just start telling me their stories of what was going on in their lives. It was a different experience than what I had had in Illinois. I'm from a small town, but um, I began to notice that there were, for me anyway, my perspective of, of those experiences was that there was a authenticity and a vulnerability that people were willing to explore around here uh, about their stories. And I found that when people did that, I was noticing a richness in it. And I had been wanting to use my background in filmmaking for something that I felt would listen well to people and not discount voices at all, but tried to offer a kind of uh, justice to it because I I really had noticed some effects, even in my own life, of not listening to everyone around me. Um, and I just felt like if there was something I could bring to an area that had started to mean so much to me with what it was sharing with me to kind of like uh, bring that out, um, I, I felt like I, I wanted to try. And I also felt like people around here, they, they seem like they really care about each other. They seem like they're really connected to each other, um, that there are some separations maybe, and, and this I could be wrong about this, but between cities sometimes, there's this county kind of neighborhood of this shared experience and the dramatic turns that they've all experienced through the history of this area that um, I felt like there was a wisdom that was a collective wisdom, an individual wisdom of things that people had gone through, and so much wisdom that people had so much that they've learned through that process of, of uh, either um, staying here after the mills closed or any kind of like upheaval or turn in their lives. I felt like I had a lot to learn from people. There was a lot of beauty here in, in their stories and that that was worth preserving and, and capturing uh, at least a piece of that. You know, we started off this conversation, you know, this is history too. This is people history. It is, yeah. So if these community organizations, these uh, local history agencies, I call them, because some are called museums, some are called societies, mm -hmm. uh, some are called associations, whatever. If they could become this center for these stories, I think that would go a long ways to preserving this often overlooked kind of history, this stuff that's right here, right now. Yeah. Once that old World War II vet dies, you ain't getting that story back. Once that oldest person in the community goes gone. I know. I, I'm, a, I'm aware of that. And, and whenever I get too aware of that, I think I'm not doing enough to do preserve people's stories. But yeah, um, right. But it seems like, I don't know, this, this area with the dramatic turns it's had, like with, with people who are still alive and experienced it, it's like, I feel like there's so many stories. I hope I can be a part of capturing some of these because there's a lot of value in it, right? There's a lot, there's so much value that it, it's a little bit afraid of it getting lost, I suppose. And it will. If we don't do it, who will do it? Right. If, as I mentioned, these historical societies, museums, if they don't do this as organizations in their communities, who's going to do it? Mm -hmm. This programmatic approach to doing this kind of work, I think is very important. That's why I ask you to be on the show here. We need to share what we do with the public to say that um, there are people like us out here. Yeah, We're willing to do this work. It's going to take some coordination. It should. It should have support from the communities. We should have partnerships with hmm. museums and historical societies so that we can make this happen. Right. Because you know what? You're going to be able to do only what you can do as an independent filmmaker. I will do what I can do as an independent audiographer. Yeah, but we can do so much more. This is really my pitch. Okay. All you people out there listening, you organizations and you people who like to support historical societies with your funding, your support dollars, this work needs to be funded too. Mm -hmm. This work needs to be supported. And there are people like you and I who are willing to do that work. So how do we make this happen? Well, one of the things that I am trying to do is I created a local history podcast initiative uh, that is trying to connect with local historical societies with this technology of podcasting. Some places have their own podcasts. Some are, we do a sort of a cooperative thing, but, you know, we're able to get some of these stories captured, uh, you know, through podcasting, mm -hmm. not necessarily the full sit down, you know, like the great work you do. I mean, just the whole film thing. I mean, that's just wonderful stuff. Very labor intensive. So, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do this through this kind of end run right here. Um, there are probably lots of different ways we can do it, but hey, however we do it, I mean, that's if we don't do it, you know, we 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 talked about that. It's gonna it's gonna be a, a a loss to all of us. I think so, yeah. And I 
I also think that if other people are interested in, in this kind of work and they, they want to find ways to collaborate, or even if they have stories, especially if they feel like, like they know someone with a story or they, or, or they themselves feel like they've learned something or, or have something that I, I think, you know, reaching out to be like, I actually have something to share. I think uh, that would be great. It's fun down here. You never know who's going to walk through the door. You never know where they're coming from. You never know what they're going to look for. And that eureka moment sometimes, if somebody finds what they've been looking for for years, it's just amazing to see their faces. And I think that's one of the things that keeps us going. I'm Laura Lee Bernanke. And I'm Bob Porter. And you're listening to the Beaver County History Podcast. History is about things and artifacts and stuff like that. But genealogy is, oh, there's a lot of artifacts, right, Laura Lee? Yeah. Sure, there's a lot of artifacts. Bob, would you agree? A lot of artifacts, documents and things involved, records. Absolutely, and, yes. Photographs. But at the essence of it, this is about people. Who we are, our, our kinfolk out there, our family lineages. And so I'm very excited to talk about genealogy and more excited, really, to talk about the center here and how this center serves Beaver County and, and really the region with the records that we have here, the family records of the county, some official, some unofficial, wide range of things you have here in services. So we're going to get into that. I'm very excited about that. So, you know what? Hey, let's start this off by talking about genealogy. You guys are the experts. What is genealogy? I think of genealogy in two categories. We have the family genealogist and we have the family historian. Somebody who's interested in genealogy may be specifically thinking of a pedigree chart where it's names and dates, birth, marriage, death, that sort of thing. But somebody who's a family historian will take that one step further. They will look into other records, records like census records, uh, city directories and phone books. They'll learn about the life of the people in their family, things that they did. Were they involved in any military actions, uh, any war records they can find on the uh, families? They'll look at church records if they can find any records of, of what the church that they went to. A lot of people, if they find the location of where the family lived, if they can, they'll travel to that place to see if the house still exists, take photographs, try to meet other uh, family members, and DNA, that's just put a whole new aspect into the whole thing. Oh, I'm sure the technology of, of DNA, I mean, mm -hmm. oh my goodness. Maybe at some point we could talk about that, because, you know, you see these commercials on TV and people say, I found out that I'm I'm Italian. Can DNA tell you that you're from, you know, a specific area, a specific region? I don't know, maybe some degree, you know, it depends on how you slice and dice it. Mm -hmm. But genealogy is really heavily infused now with all this DNA right. stuff. Yeah. Bob, what's your take on genealogy? What the heck is it to you? Well, it's a, it's a study to allow a person to get to know their ancestors. We are all part of our ancestors. Every one of them handed something down to us. Uh, there's a lot of reasons people get started in genealogy. It can be addictive once you get started. Um, one factor that many people look at is the uh, medical side of it, and um, the DNA helps to show us that, but um, you can find through studying your ancestors uh, and maybe track where a mutant gene has been handed down and, and it's causing medical problems in the current generations. But what our ancestors did in the past how they lived, it, it's all had an effect on us, whether it's through genetics or it's just through their way they raised their families, the way they, uh, they, they their beliefs as far as their religious beliefs and their uh, political beliefs. Those things are handed down, and um, we all carry some of that with us. This is a, 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 a very busy place. I mean, mm -hmm. since we've been here, I mean, we've had people come in and there's conversations going on all over the place about, uh, you know, people looking up their family histories and so forth. It's amazing mm -hmm. how active this, this center is. 
your staff. I mean, the other folks who are here. You want to tell us about the people who work here, volunteer Mm -hmm. here? We have a wonderful staff of volunteers here. There's a minimum of two staff members here every day that we're open. Uh, We're currently open Tuesdays through Saturdays for our summer hours, and that'll continue through December the 1st. Then we go to winter hours, which is Thursday through Saturday. But um, they're very knowledgeable in Beaver County uh, records that are here at the center. If they don't know the answer to a question, they'll try to find that answer for the patron. Uh, They'll try to direct them in other areas if there's other sources where they can look. We each have areas where we're more in expertise than uh, the other volunteers. Like for me, for example, I'm very familiar with Allegheny County Research. So if anybody's searching in that area, they'll come to me and ask the question. Um, Bob, you're familiar with? Pretty much just the basic general history of Beaver County. And uh, I have interest in some of the manufacturing that occurred here, particularly glass manufacturing and the pottery manufacturing. We do have one of our volunteers that is uh, very much involved with and and, uh, interested in the Civil War. What do you think about the whole digitization movement of records? Oh, you've got two levels there. You have what we digitize and we maintain here, but then you've got organizations out there some of them are for-profit organizations, some are not, that also provide digitized records. And it's opened genealogy up to people that would have never thought about sitting down and taking a pen to paper and writing and asking this one or that one. Now it's all available on the computer. The censuses have all been digitized there on the computers. For the genealogists, uh, it's made it much more much easier to reach out and locate um, other family members even, along with the, the records that show the ancestors. Websites like, like FamilySearch.org, they're digitizing their microfilm, and it's becoming available for patrons to use in their own homes. But there are some records which they are not allowed to have access in the individual's homes. You have to either go to a um, LDS church and use their family history center, or you can go to what they call an affiliate library, which is what we are here. So if a person is using familysearch.org and they pull up a document and it has a lock above the image, and when they click on it, it tells them that they either have to go to a family history library or to an affiliate library, they can come to our facility here and they'll be able to view that image here using our uh, computers. With DNA, the surprises are out there. You may not like what you find, so be prepared for the unusual. I uh, discovered a cousin, didn't know she existed. She was over 40 years old when we found her, but it turns out I had an uncle that had a extramarital affair with her mother. She is a full first cousin, and uh, we're happy to have her in the family. Turned out to be a joyful thing, but those events occurred, and those people were out there, and DNA will poke you up with them. You have to be prepared for that, right? Yeah, so, I mean, right. you open up a door, you look inside. Eh. Yeah, <laughs> people yeah, people were finding that they have uh, grandchildren out there they didn't know exist. And, oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, looking, it's an eye-opener. Yeah, looking into your family history and your background, you have to keep an open mind. Yeah, for sure. This is not just a place with books and resources. This is a very exciting, active, uh, mysterious place, right? You never know what you're going to find when you get into these records. It's fun down here because you never know who's going to walk through the door. You never know where they're coming from. You never know what they're going to look for. And that eureka moment sometimes if somebody finds what they've been looking for for years, it's just amazing to see their faces. And I think that's one of the things that keeps us going. And you have these moments here. Where we do. Where people discover do. things and they get emotional because they hadn't realized. We do. We had a, a woman actually who was in our, our genealogy classes who was looking for a person that was buried in the local cemetery. And the local cemetery actually had their records destroyed. Fortunately for that person and for us, we already have copies of that cemetery's records. So while the cemetery was trying to help them locate the burial, they had the person in the the wrong spot. But by using the records that we have here, they were able to find the actual burial location for this person. Mm. So that was nice. And we got, uh, recently we got a thank you letter 
and said, thank you for the excellent report on finding the missing pieces of my family genealogy. So it's always nice to get that little thank you note. That's priceless. Mm -hmm. Right, that is absolutely priceless. It is, and we hang that on the bulletin board that we have here so that all of our volunteer staff will see that. And We strive when somebody comes in here to find what they're looking for, and in many occasions we don't find a specific information, but we find something else. We do not like people to leave here empty-handed. And what do you mean? You give gifts away, or what? <laughs> no, we get, we try to give them some information and something they did they didn't have when they came. That's relevant to their genealogy or their history search. And as a result, we get um, we get a lot of uh, of thanks from people when they when they out the door. Mm-hmm.